Hey guys, this is attorney Walter Rudolph Not the Third with Disability Resolution PA, the most viewed social security disability attorney in America via YouTube and the most subscribed to. Now let's get right to it. I wanted to go through as we're going into the holiday season and think about those things that would be the most horrific, terrible things that a disabled person could hear going into 2023 and being in 2023. What we're going to do is we're going to go through the top 10. We're going to start at 10 and go all the way up to number one. Now, remember, number one is the absolute worst that someone could potentially hear, other than, of course, their potential immediate death, right? So we're going to keep it below that standard. Now, with that said, this video is solely for Social Security disability insurance benefits, not supplemental security income benefits, okay? So if you're on SSI, this video is not for you. We're going to be making another video for you. Some of these things do apply to the SSI, but some of them don't because of how the rules work. All right, let's get right into this thing real quick. Deb Carter, howdy, howdy. Slatherings, Kathleen Powers, howdy. So guys, real quick, we're going to start at number 10. Actually, we're going to start at 11 because I always give you guys a little bit more. Number 11, of the absolute worst things that you could potentially hear as a disabled person in 2023, the sound of a transmission or engine problem in a car. Now, I want to talk about this real quick. Most people who are disabled worry about two main things other than their health insurance, you know, and what's going on with their medication. But outside of their medical treatment, there's the rent and there's the transportation. If they're lucky enough to have a vehicle, that's one of those things when, when the vehicle has some sort of problem, has some sort of issue. In the back of that disabled person's mind, they constantly try to drive it less and less and less and less distances. Okay, So the distances aren't as far. It's just one of those things where they don't want to risk it, right? Uh, so a smaller distance, rather. So Now, with that said, you got to keep in mind car problems, engine, transmission problems, those are a huge deal. So if a disabled person hears some sort of weird new noise going on or it doesn't shift into gear as well, that's absolutely traumatic for a disabled person. Now, this is my number 11. We're now going to go to number 10. We're going to go all the way up the list to number one. If you feel that I've missed one, let me know in the comments because keep in mind, this is what I came up with. I want to know what you think about. And here's why it's important. We take this list on a, on a bigger spectrum, on a larger spectrum, and we go ahead and do a calculation to figure out what things need to be addressed first when it comes to the fears that people experience when it comes to Social Security disability benefits. Because if we can make these situations less egregious, less horrific in 2023, then we've actually done a huge service to the disabled. Now, number 10, your insurance will not cover that procedure. Now, I don't care what impairments you have. There is a large percentage of the disabled who de facto need to get some procedure. They'll still remain disabled, most of them. You know, it's a surgery or this or that or whatever, but there's some procedure. And the truth is, finding a Medicaid doctor who's willing to do it, very difficult, or having Medicare cover something that's kind of new or off plan, it's extremely tough. So one of the things that the disabled really hate to hear is that there might be some solution to make their life a little bit better, but they're not covered for it. Why is this so bad? Well, it harkens back to the day of essentially when there were kings, when there were pharaohs, and all these super high up individuals. Even though we do have those today, we still have kings. Uh, to some degree, we have pharaohs. We still have empirical individuals like China. The bottom line is that people who are in different classes get to have basically different chances at beating something that is affecting them medically. So let me give you an example. If you are homeless, the likelihood of you beating a particular cancer might be that you have a 10% chance of actually beating it. You move it up to low income, a 20% chance. You move it up to middle income, right? Now we're at a 30% chance. Middle high income, a 40% chance. High income, a 50% chance. Now we're getting into the wealthy, right? So we're talking about 50 million, we're talking about 100 million. Now we're looking at like 70 to 80% chance. Now we're talking about near billionaires and billionaires. You've got a 90 to 95% chance of beating it. This is what is so perplexing about the human race. Um, when it comes to the future of human survival, and I hate to bring this up in a sense, but I think we should talk about it. I do think it's important. I think it is really important. Oh, yeah, guys, please remember to like, 
subscribe and leave five star reviews for the channel. Thank you, Bobby Bo, for reminding me there. I really appreciate it. Um, if this channel helps you in any way to think about things or get disability benefits, please remember to leave a five star review or a like or subscribe. Now, here's one thing that we're going to do a whole video on, but I just want to bring the topic up. As a human race, we focus heavily on being able to earn the benefits that we receive. Okay, SSI doesn't work that way. I know, I get it. But SSDI benefits, retirement benefits, we earn the benefits that we receive. However, when it comes to health, the problem is that not everybody can be at the top of the pyramid and get that particular medical treatment to save their life, which means that all human life in a human society, right? The U.S. government, Congress, Constitution, everybody under that, right? Is worth a particular thing. You may not think about that, but the government has many times had to decide what that life is worth. And they do that when somebody passes away in the military. They do that when somebody becomes sick in the military. They do that in many fashions where they've had to calculate specifically what they're willing to give them as a result of the worth of their life to the United States. With that said, and here's the, the, the saucy part, if you will, the problem we run into is that many people who essentially don't have the right insurance to cover a particular procedure fall back into not being worthy of the medical coverage that they need to have a solution to their particular impairment. If we as America focused on, instead of having big pharma dictating essentially what they will release, that is a solution, that is a cure, and, you know, re kind of figure this out to be a situation where people are able to access all innovations, people are able to access innovative drugs, then people will live longer. But then you have to ask yourself, if those people are living longer, are they being productive to the society, that which is paying out to those people by giving them access to these newer, better drugs? And that's where the whole retirement problem comes along, because the retired have an extremely low worth, and the disabled have an even lower worth to the system that is paying out money. Because the more money this system has to pay out, the lower the worth of that individual to the society that they exist in, which is horrible. That's the way we look at it. That's the way our system works. The reality is this. If somebody is disabled younger, the SSA calculates specifically how much money over the length of their time they're going to have to go ahead and pay out. Could be $300,000, could be $400,000, but they have to pay out over the life of a young person becoming disabled so that person lives their entire life. So the people over here saying, well, they don't love the retired. They don't love the retired because we don't fit into their societal, you know, making money so that they can tax us and blah, 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 blah. And you're right. You're right. The love is not as strong for those people as the middle working class. However, there's even less love for the disabled who are found disabled earlier in life and then cost vastly more going forward. It's interesting because it tells you all about the worth of a human life to the United States government. And I think the United States government is miles ahead in a positive way than other countries where, you know, they literally discard their disabled and they discard their retired. If you look at, you know, people who say, well, that's not realistic. That's not fair. That's not how nature works. Nature works by, you know, essentially things eating things. That's the way nature works to survive you know, keep going. It's one energy source being converted into another energy source. But then when you say, what is a civil nation? What is a gentleman's nation? What is a gentlewoman's nation? You come to the realization that it's the support of life that exists with its continuation to its full extent. It's something we should talk about at some point. Number nine, the new tests show significant improvement. So when the disabled here your new tests have come out, like the doctor walks in and said, ah, it's amazing, wonderful, we're seeing all this incredible improvement. Wow, wow, Benny Hill, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for the 1999 donation. I really, really appreciate it. I love I love the uh, mechanized, <laughs> I haven't seen that one before, the mechanized missile, uh, the missile launching and ultra crab grabby uh, hippo. I love it. <laughs> it kind of reminds me of Sweetie, my dog. Uh, with that said, that's amazing. That's super amazing. So with that said, 
when a disabled person hears that the medical doctor is saying that some test shows significant improvement, the disabled person is immediately starting to worry because they know if they go through something in the future that reviews them, their benefits could be cut off. Now, if they're a VA person, you have to look at the uh, what percentage did they have? Was there an improvement? Did they reach permanent in total? But just for the civilian aspect, they'll go and do what's called an eight-step sequential process as part of a continuing disability review. Okay, we did. We've done other videos on the eight-step. We've done other videos on the CDRs. We're going to skip that for right now. But it's where they re-review to see if you are still disabled. And here's the important part: under the old rules. The crazy thing is that a lot of people who are found disabled six, seven years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, of many of those who were found disabled back then would not today be considered disabled under the new rules and regulations. So when you have that amazing friend that's like, I know everything there is to know, you just collect your records and you submit them, and boom, you're found disabled. That's an idiot. And it's okay. Everybody has an idiot. We all collect idiots. We all have an idiot here. We have an idiot there. That's okay. That's fine. But what's super important is that you learn as much as you can about your particular impairments. So that's one of the things I always tell people that they, they don't like to hear because they just want me to fix it. They want me to win the benefits and be done. But when you work with an attorney, and this is incredibly important, the attorney doesn't make the decision for your disability benefits. Like I, I am the most viewed and subscribed to disability attorney in America. I've got a lot of clients and I'm telling you the secret here. The secret is I don't get to decide if you're disabled. All I do is I take the statutes and I negotiate a legend onset dates and I brief the judges and, and submit motions to the judge to try and trial tactic you into a win. That's what I do. Sometimes it requires a hearing, sometimes before a hearing, sometimes we have a trial. That's what happens. Okay. So the reality is that it's much harder to get somebody found disabled nowadays. So every little thing that you say, every little thing that your doctor states, every th little thing that their doctor states, it can be used to really harm you. And at the same time, the social security disability laws and regulations are still very broad when it comes to pinpointing exactly where the balance line is for being found disabled. Because remember, when you've got one impairment, you just look at the listings or the equivalency to the listings, right? But when you have many impairments, it's tricky. And how would you make something perfectly line up? And well, this element equals this element equals this element. You just, you wouldn't. Because there's no way to tell. There's no way to tell because you've got all these impairments. Can the person work? Maybe. Who knows? Let me think about it. You can't make a perfect system. So that's what people are worried about when, when they hear, like if somebody heard in 2023, ah, your new test show test shows significant improvement. Your doctor walks in the room and just lays it on you. The disabled person is sitting there going, oh God, oh God, I'm going to lose my monthly check. I'm going to lose my health insurance. All right. Now we're going to number eight. Your doctor is retiring. A lot of people who aren't disabled would hear this and say, why would that be a big deal? What's the deal? When somebody's doctor that they've had for a really long time or that they've interacted with or that they've worked with for a really long time retires, it's almost like they've just gained a new impairment, a new problem, because their doctor knew what was going on. They had a certain flight path that they were able to fly to go ahead and try different things to have a successful outcome. Some people really connect with the doctor. Some people really connect with a different doctor. And we all kind of just, you know, swim around in the pool of, of medicine to find that doctor that works the best with our questions and what's going on. So when somebody who is disabled on social security disability insurance benefits and their doctor retires and they go to the office and the, and the receptionist goes, oh, hey, just a heads up. And they always do that. Just a heads up. Just want to let you know, da, 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 da. so and so, Dr. So and so has officially retired. Those people have like a little PTSD moment where they start freaking out because they don't know if the new doctor is going to like them. They don't know if the new doctor is going to support their impairments. They don't know if the new doctor is going to change their medications that are working well. They go through this whole big thing and it's absolutely horrific for them. Now, let's go down to the next one, number seven. You are going through a short form CDR. Now, some of you guys have been through CDRs, ain't been through a lot of them, right? The computer sends them out. It's just part of the gig. You're cool. But there are people who get them for the first time and they go 
into a freak out mode. Doesn't matter if they have mental impairments, the anxiety, depression, panic attacks, schizoaffective, and job. Doesn't matter if they have all those things. What it comes down to is they go into freak out mode. They don't get that a short form is not super big deal, but at the same time, it can develop into a big deal. And here's what happens when a person gets a short form, they know that their medical records are going to be ordered. They know that the statements they make on that form are forever. And at the end of the day, if they do anything wrong, anything wrong, they could lose the video game. Think about that. Think about it. Have you ever played those old school video games where it's like if you didn't do a particular thing at a particular time, it was over? That's what it feels like for those people because they have a balance system. They get their check. They got their health insurance. They got everything together. They know where they're staying. They know how to get to their doctor, yada, yada, yada. They're good, okay? But then when you send them a short form CDR, oh, ho, ho, big deal because now all of a sudden the little world that they live in, the ecosystem that they built could be taken away. All right. Next one, number six, you receive a letter in the mail that says you're going through a CDR and you know it is the long form. So what this means basically is that you essentially have gotten the worst of the two. The long form means that of the CDRs, they're going to be looking a bit more into your claim. They're going to be spending more time on their analysis. There's going to be more hup hup when it comes to the eight step sequential process. They want to know more information, what's going on what changes have occurred, all of those things. Now, as a result of that, you have to consider something. When you go through this, some people get these just because the computer output it. Some people get these, it's because it's on a schedule. But at the end of the day, when they get the long form, they know the likelihood of their benefits being removed is just a little bit higher. And that just a little bit higher can be very, very traumatic to somebody who's basically set up their life to be able to survive. Now, I have to explain to some people why this is so traumatic for other people. If you are found disabled, and let's say it took you three years to be found disabled, could have taken six, nine, 15, whatever. But let's say it took you three years. You've been on disability benefits for four years. You get that letter, the little world that you built in that short period of time to be safe, even though you were you know, homeless, pretty much going through all that process during that time, you essentially run into a new situation, which is, you could go ahead and have to fight for years and years and years and years to go back onto disability benefits. That's what's going through their mind. They're thinking, oh, if I lose my benefits, and they're not even thinking about how quickly they can get them attached, right? They're not even at the step when they first get that form where they're like, okay, I have 10 days to go ahead and request that basically they be kept on throughout this adjudication process. You know, and then they go through the process of like, but if I lose, I have a massive overpayment. What am I going to do? Oh, no. The truth is, guys, the system is built as a little bit of a fail and bailer system. If you get a long form and they intend to remove your benefits through adjudication and then they do. Right. So let's say that, uh, you know, you go ahead and, you know, you get the long form, you submit it, you go through a couple of adjudications and then they cut the benefits off. Right. That person is thinking. What am I going to do? Because if you end it there, if you end the appeals, then that's it. You owe an overpayment to the federal treasury. Now, there's another thing too. If you keep those benefits going on every single month, no attorney will represent you because there's no way for them to get paid because there's no back pay because every single month you're getting a check still, which means that you're not going to get the help you need to beat it. Now, look, Here's the deal. This is always, this is like the, the balancing or like the linchpin moment, right? Where basically those people who are like, I know everything about disability. I can handle it. Everything's fine. Then they get kicked off of disability benefits, right? And all those like 50,000 people that they advise, like, all you got to do is go to the doctor and tell them this, right? At that moment, they have that, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing. I've lost faith. I don't know what the statutes are. I don't even know how to research it. I don't know what the case law is or the SSRs. What are the problems? How does this work? When that happens, that's when those people become incredibly aggressive on the phone. I hardly ever take those people on as clients when they've lost their benefits. And let me tell you why. The first phone call, you can tell who those people are because they start screaming at you about how angry they are with the SSA because those people truly felt that they were untouchable. And so they'll start screaming at you 
And how dare they? And how could they? And da 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 They hold all the power, guys. They decide if you're disabled and get a check and get health insurance. They hold all the power. All right, next thing here. Now we're going to go to number five. Your doctor recategorizes a major diagnosis. Now, I put this one higher up because this one can really, really hurt you in a big way. Maybe it could be you know lower on the list, but I think that this one's very, very harmful. Let me tell you why. So the bottom line is if your doctor recategorizes one of your major impairments, right? So let's say it's this impairment and then they switch it to this impairment because they were wrong about this one, but they think it's this one. And they want to try medication and treatment for this one to see if it affects and helps you. Well, guess what? You were found disabled under this. And when they change your impairment to this, it triggers different elements in the eight-step sequential process review because you no longer have this. You now have this, which means your fast track through the eight-step sequential process doesn't exist anymore. I know that's a little tricky thing that people don't know about. And here's the thing that you got to really understand about that because it's, it's not good. When they begin assessing you under this other thing, that other thing might have a different scale for severity. So if they try this medication and they're excited for that medication to have some effect because they just prescribed, they just, you know, did a diagnostic compression saying you have this new impairment. The doctor is excited. The therapist excited to see something happen, some improvement. Otherwise, why is the insurance company paying them? So all of a sudden, apparently on paper, you're improving. Even though you got these new medications, even though you're going through all this stuff and you're not really getting better, all of a sudden on paper, what the doctor signing, what really matters in court is improving. And that's not a good thing because at the end of the day, all of a sudden you don't have the thing that you were found disabled on and this new thing you're improving on. And so all of a sudden you could get taken off of disability benefits, A, and B, you're going to have a real tough time getting back on because now the new adjudication standards are going to be applying to you with the new rules of today, not the rules of back then for some of these new impairments if you let a denial occur and you don't go ahead and appeal it, which is super scary and really, really tough. Again, it's just one of those things where you got to watch it. You really got to watch it because at the end of the day, if you lose your benefits, you want a clean path to get back on them. But if you lose the thing that got you disabled to begin with, it changes the eight-step sequential process. You get a denial, you're going back to the five-step sequential process of a traditional disability filing under the new rules. Not easy, guys. Not a good situation. Okay, next thing. Over here, we're going to go through basically number four. Your doctor removes a major diagnosis. Now, this really hurts VA people, right? If they lose that chunk or that percentage because the, the doctor removed it, they're in a tailspin. The money they were accustomed to, what was going on, they're in a tailspin. Same thing for those receiving Social Security disability insurance benefits and also supplemental security income benefits. When a doctor removes a major diagnosis, right, there has to be some reason for it. It could be that all of a sudden your liver healed itself, which doesn't really happen much, but hey, you know, miracles happen. It could be that you're no longer experiencing anxiety. You know, now that you've kind of normalized things, you're on medication, you don't have to go to work every day, you've been receiving continuous me mental therapy from a psychologist or psychiatrist, whatever. It means that you could be good. The anxiety is no longer there. The medication worked. You're living a simpler life. Everything's good to go. They remove it. You got a big problem. A huge problem because you are not disabled if that was one of the things that was used as part of a vocational allowance, right? Whether or not you can work due to multiple impairments or a listing allowance being that you were found disabled for one particular type of impairment, depression, anxiety, low IQ, PTSD, all these different potentials, right? And they've got categories, right? You, you've got musculoskeletal, respiratory, you've got uh, any, anything, you, you, anything. You got neurological options, you have special senses options. There's all these different impairments that fit into the listings, okay? Now, with that said, when you lose that, you know a CDR is coming around the corner and you know that CDR is not going to go well. Okay, next one. Number three. So we're getting up to number one. We're getting close to number one. Number three. The worst thing, number three on the list that you could hear as a disabled person in 2023 is the following. Child support 
has been approved against you for twins. Indeed, indeed, it's not a great situation. So here's the kicker. SSDI people, different uh, groups, right, can attach to you, right? Because those benefits, you earn them, they're paid to you, you can move out of the country with them. But also, if you owe child support, if you owe alimony, if you owe uh, against a worker's lien, guess what? They can attach to those benefits and they can collect those benefits. So if somebody just heard, hey, twins on the way, and they're still super disabled, guess what? A chunk of their money is going to the kids. And I've seen many situations where people had to switch from SSDI benefits over to SSI benefits because they couldn't get enough money on SSDI benefits because too much of it was being taken away for the children. Now, obviously, I advocate for the benefit of the children, but I also advocate for essentially, I'm an advocate for the benefit of the children, but I also advocate essentially for those who are disabled. So the bottom line is, if an individual can't afford to live because child support is taking too much of their SSDI benefits, then they have to switch to SSI benefits, and then the children will not be able to go ahead and get any benefits, which sounds horrible. It sounds horrible. But another thing that's absolutely horrible is a person who can't afford to have the bare minimum. We're talking $841 per month, right, on SSI and Medicaid to be able to survive. It's a no-win situation, and there's no beautiful ethical outcome here. There's no, like, happy middle place. There should be. There really should be, but there's not. It's another thing the politician should have fixed. If I were a politician, I would fix it, but I'm not a politician. I own a disability law firm, and I work this stuff every day. Now, with that said, we're going now down to number two of the most horrific, terrible things a social security disability insurance beneficiary could hear or see in 2023. Number two, the Social Security Administration has been stating that there has been improvement and therefore your benefits will be terminated on such and such date or what some of the letters state effective immediately or effective on this date. That is one of the most horrific things, terrible, terrible things that a person can hear. First off, you've got a bunch of deadlines. And if you're not used to dealing with deadlines as a disabled person, it becomes really difficult to automatically wind your brain up and get it ready to go ahead and start calling here, faxing here, emailing this, reaching out to this doctor. All of a sudden, you are in freakout mode with good reason because. You now have 10 days to go ahead and say, I want to keep my benefits. You have to go ahead and go through this whole process of proving that you're disabled again. You have to go through this whole process of realizing emotionally that you're about to lose your health insurance. You're going through this mental process of realizing, holy cow, my medication is attached to my insurance. You then go through the whole process of going, well, wait a minute. If I lose my benefits, I can't pay my rent and rent is due next month. So you begin this process of trying to ensure your benefits continue, ensure it keeps going. Now, some people, they just continue their benefits and they don't do a thing. Some people go into freakout mode. Some people call an attorney immediately and find that if they, can, if they keep, kept their benefits, the attorney can't represent them. So the system is set up poorly in that regard. We need to fix it. If I were a politician, fix it. But once again, I'm a disability law firm. I'm the guy who fights kind of, you know, against the government, but also with the government to try and make sure that you guys receive your social security disability benefits. It's my job to convince judges, you know, adjudicators, DDS reps, et cetera, that you truly are disabled based on the rules and regulations. But let me assure you of the following. Every single year, the system, including the POMs, the procedural, how they do things, becomes more and more anti-claimant instead of what originally was, which was very pro-claimant. You can blame that on fraud. You can blame that on all kinds of things. Too many people are in the system. The doors of access to it were just wide, way too wide open. The politicians should have fixed it 20 years ago, but now it's running out of money for retirement. And uh, the other trust funds are you know, having difficulties as well. Remember, this thing was supposed to last for as long as America lasted not have a end date, right? Not have a, we're low on cash date. Remember that, that's important. All right, 
Number one, the most scary thing a disabled person receiving Social Security disability insurance could hear in 2023 is that your impairment has become end stage, terminal, or requires a settling of your affairs. I want to make something very clear. And there's something that happens with advertisements. And it's something that a lot of people see on TV, the billboards. And I think it's wonderful. I think the point and purpose and ultimate outcome of it is excellent. But you need to know the reality of it because there's a lot of BS to it. You know, when you see those wonderful hospital signs that say, I beat this. You see a TV commercial where the person's going for a run when they should have passed away two years ago. Those are the survivors. Those are the people who made it into and made it out of the Navy SEALs. That's how small of a group we are talking about. What you don't hear about, and even though the odds are getting better and better for survival, because the luxury drugs, the luxury procedures are now becoming commonplace because the doctors want to do more of them to earn more money off of the insurance that you pay for. What's happening now is that people are getting this false sense of reality when it comes to a bad thing that usually equates to certain death. There's a lot of things in America that we tend to do. We tend to create this falsified world where you can beat anything and you can be anything. And wow, you have the potential of the stars. But look at your family. Look at your family. How many of them achieved what you thought they could? Reaching out, grabbing, squeezing the juice out of one of those stars. How many of them actually got the stardust? Not many, not a ton, probably one, maybe none, right? Okay, that's fine. Is what it is, and that's okay. It's okay. We're not all meant to be stars. We're not. We're not. I don't have the talent to go and sing and play guitar in the voice. I'm just glad I know people that were able to do it. That's amazing to me to even know them. I don't have the talent to go ahead and, you know, fly a spaceship into outer space. I just don't have, I don't have it. I don't have the education on the background. I mean, if it worked really hard, I could figure out how to push the buttons. Maybe, unless it required some really unique, like, ah, you got to get it perfect, which a lot of stuff is automated. So let's hope. <laughs> let's hope. With that said, and this is incredibly important, there are a significant amount of people who end up passing away each year. Now, the advertisements they push and God bless them. They really do. God speed to them. They push and people fight because they want a chance to beat that terminal situation. But let me assure you, we don't have the technology, or at least it wasn't released to us, to live forever. And at some point, whether you're on disability benefits or not, we meet that end. And what's tough, what's really hard is when you think about that, we're a human being. We live on this earth. We are in the best country, the wealthiest country, America, United States. Wow. Yeehaw. Howdy, howdy. Amazing. When you think about it, right? Take a moment. And then you think the SSA every year to two years to three years is going to, well, not two years because they got rid of that. So every year or three years is going to be sending me a list to see if I'm still disabled and deserve my check to be able to survive, live, have health insurance, medication, and be able to be slightly above homeless. Is that living? Then, on top of that, you learn the word terminal. You learn the word affairs in a non-family law sense. And then, perspective. Time speeds up. You don't have as much. You're running out. You got to fight this war, not just a battle, a war. And you don't have an army and you got a problem. I wanted to outline these things because I wanted you to understand this is how I saw it. And it's not a perfect list. I get that. But help me make a better list. And I want to make sure you understand why this is important. Let's go through it now the other way. Let's pretend we are politicians 
We are American House or Senate or the President of the United States. I'm giving you and blessing you with the capacity to be a politician who decides our laws and therefore the customs and the culture of our society, right? You are now blessed with the capacity. We're going to go through it backwards. Number one, your impairment has become end stage terminal or requires the settling of your affairs. How do we make these people's lives better? Do we promise something to their family? Do we make sure that we have a means to protect what happens when they pass away? Or do we just put it on them and let them figure it out? If there's no spot to bury them, we'll just, we'll handle it. Think about it. You are a politician now. You have the duty to figure it out and make their life better. Number two, the Social Security Administration stating that there has been improvement and therefore your benefits will be terminating. How do we make it better for these people? We just cut them off? Or do we do a reduced schedule? Do we give them a certain amount of time and other benefits as well to be able to prove their claim because they can't hire an attorney? What do we do to make it better? Number three, child support has been approved against you for twins and you're disabled. Well, you obviously can't work more because you're disabled. What do we do? They attach to your disability benefits, your SSDI benefits, not SSI, only SSDI benefits. What do we do? Well, think about it. Should we have a fund for those who have children who are disabled? Do we want the kids to grow up in poverty? I mean, the kids are going to have to get financial you know, health, uh, help from the temporary assistance for needy families. They're still going to need food stamps. They're still going to need these other things. How do we make sure the future children of America can become the future scientists, lawyers, doctors, house builders, electricians, and partygoers? How do we do it? There's a lot of Disney partying going on. How do we do it? I say that because our moderator has a little Disney, Disneyites, which is awesome. I love it. I love it. I love the pictures I, I've seen. Um, they have such a good time and she takes such great care of her kids. I mean, she like creates custom like Disney events for them. Like, holy cow. Like, that's a like good job, mom, right there. There's a good job, mom, right there. Next thing. Number four, your doctor removes a major diagnosis. Should there be protections afforded beyond just the eight step sequential process? Should there be a ramping down effect? Or do we do a CDR and cut those benefits? Number five, the doctor recategorizes a major diagnosis. You know, what's funny is the SSA reserves the time, has the time, when you get into a car accident, to expand the amount of time your adjudication takes because they want to see how healthy you get as a result of it. Because your impairments have to last 12 months and be severe. But yet, at the same time, when the doctor recategorizes a major diagnosis, what ramping period do we afford to the disabled to remain in a safe environment to continue to get treatment to see what's going to happen? What programs do we have, people? You're the politician. Hup, hup, let's think. Number six, you receive a letter in the mail that says you are going through a CDR and you know it is the long form version. Number seven, it is a short form version. How many of you have gone through it not knowing your rights of what actually happens? How many of you have any clue as to what the steps are? Sure, they have a little intro that they tell you about. They tell you what your major steps are, but none of it includes how to fight it. Should it include how to fight it? Should it include things beyond just the, you can build your claim by doing this? Going to this, and you can get medical, and we can buy the medical doc, and we can look at the medical doc, and then we get the, the, the documentation shows you're not disabled anymore. Shouldn't there be a better process in place? Because attorneys aren't going to represent them if they retain their benefits, which means retaining the ability to pay their rent. Just a thought. Number eight, your doctor is retiring. Well, how do we make that easier for people? Think about it. You got to turn it on and you got to really look at it. A person is retiring that back to you. Some people hated their doctor. It's a blessing. Some people love their doctor. 
It's one of the scariest things in the world. The people that hated the doctor, yay, go find a new one. The people that love their doctor, how do we help the transition process? Your politician, your senator right now, I expect something on my desk in the morning. I'm <laughs> just kidding. You ain't going to write that. All right, next thing. Number nine, your new test shows significant improvement. Do we go by that? What well, was the test? What's the weight, right? That's what the SSA does. We shall balance the weight. We shall look at the weight. What is the weight of this evidence? Where does it stand? Is it this way? Is it that way? Where does it go, right? If there's significant improvement, how do we make sure that we are certain? How much time is allowed to go by before we are certain that they just weren't doing better for six months, that their body learned for a short period how to fight the problem? Well, I expect the answers, guys. Number 10, your insurance will not cover that procedure. That's a huge one. I mean, honestly, and I know Biden did like a little thing, but then he also ruined something that Trump did. That was incredible. It's if I could just say one thing about health insurance, the politicians, they'll scratch out an inch forward in your direction and then they'll lose two inches the next year. That's what happens. And it's so frustrating. And you know what the big problem is? Most of these politicians they don't know how health insurance works unless they're getting funded with their future, right, to go ahead and run as a politician again. Then they are told how it works by a very biased group. Final one, the sound of a transmission or engine problem in a car. Why do we not have special transportation options beyond just what Medicaid or Medicare affords? for the disabled. Why don't we have a fund that literally helps people fix their car so long as they can prove that that was their vehicle, it had a problem? Why don't we have some sort of assessment system? If they have their vehicle and they're willing to pay for the gas, what's the differential of having to pay for their transportation by hiring a person and paying a vehicle and paying the gas versus fixing their car? Which is more expensive? Usually hiring a person, paying for the fuel, paying for the vehicle, paying for the insurance, firing and then hiring this person because the first person wasn't doing a good job. This is more expensive. Why don't we have a system that promotes this? Look, I understand that the current government, the White House is going to be giving everybody a Tesla. Just kidding. It would be unconstitutional. Just like me trying to get some of my student loans forgiven since it was like, you know, predatory lending when I was a kid, you know, just that stuff. But uh, don't worry. It's unconstitutional. You're safe. I'm still going to be a slave for the rest of my life paying off these student loans. Guys, now with that said, we are going to run into doing some questions. I hope you enjoyed the show. Um, these are the top 10, I gave you 11 things that a social security disability insurance represent or, uh, individual, a claimant, a beneficiary would hate to hear. And the sad thing is we don't have great systems to fix those. Now, if you think of anything that I missed on this, right? If there's anything that I was like, ah, I should have put that in. I put it to, I could, whatever. If I miss something, put it on the list because one day, if I ever become a politician, I'm going to fix all these because you know what matters? You pick the one thing that is the nuclear bomb that is exploding the soonest and you fix that, right? Unless your dog is hungry, then you feed your dog. Then you approach the nuclear missile. All right, guys, let's get right to it. Some of us have chubby dogs. I'm going to be going ahead and taking some phone calls real quick. You guys know how this works. One person kept calling in. I want to go ahead and just get that person on the phone. They called way before the show. They paid. Play, uh, they called in during uh, the beginning of the show. Let me go ahead and get this person on the phone real quick, uh, and uh, we'll begin this process. I have everything set up. Look at this; it's all ready to go. Here we go, guys. I'm going to put this thing right by the speaker, or rather the uh, microphone. Let's see if we can get this person on the phone and get this thing rolling real quick. Here we go. Howdy, howdy. This is Attorney yes, Walter Knott. We are live on YouTube. Remember to use a fake name throughout this process. Now, would you like me to answer a specific question, or would you like me to run hearing questions with you? Um, I'd like to answer a specific question. Perfect, madam. How can I help you? Okay, I'm currently on Social Security Disability since 2018. Okay. 
and I'm also a hundred percent disabled veteran. Perfect. I yes, and so I'm in the back to trial trial to work program for Social Security. Sure. And of course, I'm not. Work, I can't work full time. I'm, I'm I'm incapable of making that. But I've already completed six months, and so Social Security has sent me a letter saying, "Hey, we see that you've done six months, and by March 2023." You completed the nine month trial period, um, and then at that time we we will do a review, and mm -hmm. this will be my first review. Mm -hmm. Should I be concerned about anything? Yeah, I mean the reality is this: so the trial work period is a carrot program to try and get you off of disability benefits. It basically gives you nine months where you get to keep your disability benefits and go ahead and receive your you know money that you earn. But here's the kicker. You have an extended eligibility period thereafter. So if you're earning under that $1,350, the SGA amount, you can go ahead and usually keep that money for another 36 months. However, here's the problem you're going to run into. A lot of people who are working, earning, doing okay, they want to go on to essentially a ticket to work program. They want to earn more money. They want to get five more years where they get to keep that money. But you've got a tricky part to this, which is you have VA benefits. I'm assuming permanent in total. You said 100%. So I'm guessing I'm guessing on top of that. Oh, well, no, wait, wait a minute. You're not permanent total because you're working. So what is your percentage with the no, VA? No, I'm, I'm 100%. Yeah, service connected. So then what are you earning per month? Uh, from from the, from the back to work? Uh, yeah, where you're working. Like per month, what are you working and earning? I'm only earning maybe about $1,000 to $1,100 a month. All right. So you're still under SGA for the 2022 amount, $1,350. Yeah. So here's here's yeah. the kicker. You, All right. And I always tell people this. If you're going to work, earn as much as you can. Because if you go over that 900 and whatever dollars to, to trigger that trial work period, then you just lost one of your you know, trial work periods and only get nine months of it. Now, they do reset. And I did a video where I went through like how many years you have to wait for it to reset or if you lose your benefits, refile and get found disabled, you get them again. I went through a video on that. But the bottom line is what you have to be worried about is the CDR process because you've now proven over a nine month period that you have the capacity to earn essentially wages that were pretty close to full time. So let me ask you this. With the job that you have, and we'll just go through the basics, were you a you know manager, supervisor, or trainer? No, I was I was a clinical supervisor. I'm a I'm a licensed clinical therapist. Okay, so you have special so, education. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I have special education. Okay, so you have special. And, and my disability was a double stroke. I had a double stroke, so I have mobility issues, and I have a processing issues. So I, I slow in processing. But I am typing issues, all those type of issues right now. So how are you able to do that job? And what I'm really getting at is what accommodations did you use to be able to do that job to earn that thousand bucks a month? I, I'm doing telehealth mm -hmm. and I'm only doing like maybe four or five clients a week. That's it. Okay. And and with that, I'm utilizing like a, um, what's that program to help me type because I, I can't mm -hmm. really type because of my mobility issues sure. and I have partial hearing loss also. So, okay. um, so that's why I'm able to do that. But the reason I'm making so much is because with, even though I have that many, I'm making that much, I make like maybe $50 an hour per client because of my, my specialty and my life. Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but, and it varies. It's fifty dollars an hour I make if I'm with the client uh, forty five minutes, then it's forty dollars or if I'm with them thirty minutes it's twenty five dollars an hour. So it varies. So I mean, but I can't handle a full load of clients. I'm unable to do that for full time. So here's what I would do. Um, your employer, uh, I'm guessing you're working for a larger group. That larger group, uh, have they given per, you know permission to you to have all these different accommodations? Like is it on paperwork at management? Um, not, not at this time because okay. they, they don't pay for it, but they do have me down as being disabled and they do understand they can't give me a full load. They know my disability. I'm not, I'm not capable of taking on a full load. Okay. So I'm on like part-time, like PRN. 
Okay, so that needs to be papered over. You got to thread the needle on that one and make sure that they have that on paper in their management system so that when you request a report of accommodations that you receive as a result of being able to do this job, that you're able to show that no other employer in a competitive market would be able to hire you and retain you with all those accommodations. So okay. the, the next thing you're going to go ahead and want to work on is showing that your impairment is staying the same in severity or getting worse. So what were, and I mean, the easiest way for me, for me to ask you this is what were your VA percentages of allowance for your impairments? Well, my VA um, retired 100% is for my PTSD. Oh, wow. My social security, of course, which is different. My mm -hmm. social security disability, I don't know if they rate PTSD or not, but they rate my... I guess when when I was um, my stroke, I couldn't I couldn't do anything, you know. Mm -hmm. But I, I have some of my mobility back, but I don't have it all the way back. So but yeah, the SSA doesn't use a uh, a percentage analysis scale. It's more of a totality of the circumstances of you know whether you have the capacity to work full time uh, for the SSA. But right. The VA they use that percentage. So 100% PTSD with the VA. I gotta like. For a moment there, that's really tough to get because the VA biases against PTSD very strongly. So that's incredible that you're able right. to get that. Right. Um, now, with that said, right. um, so and we're talking about stroke limitations, physical, mental, and then we're talking about PTSD. So, okay, understanding that, can you tell me um, what are some of the uh, things that your doctors are writing down to show that you are limited in your ability to, you know, basically have medical treatment? basically go ahead and continue medical treatment, uh, receive pills, are the pills working? Like what are your doctors doing to make sure that they outline that you are either treatment resistant or having a difficult time receiving and functioning with the treatment you are having? Um, well, I have, I have VA doctors and I have private insurance. So both doctors are documenting that. The VA has already approved me. So they're gonna be doing some um, I, sometimes it's hard for me to speak and, and speak my words. Um, they, they've already approved me to do some handicap accessible renovations at my house because of my mobility issue. So they're going to be having contractors coming out to do handicap um, accessible stuff to my house because of my mobility issues. Okay. Um, so let's talk about what mobility issues, what they're installing and what would be helpful as evidence for the installation process. What things are they installing in your house, uh, that you already know about? Um, they're going to redo the shower to make it a walk-in shower with railings on it and a seat. So because I'm unable to stand for long periods of time, mm -hmm. they're going to reinforce it. I have a two story home, so they're going to reinforce the railings on my on my stairwell, they're going to um, make sure all my doors are handicap accessible where a wheelchair can be come in. Mm -hmm. I have a service dog, and um, they're going to do some things where I could step up in my truck for my service dog. Yeah, because my psychiatrist would prescribe me the service dog, so I have a service dog also. So they're going to change some of my doors in my house. They're going to change the toilets and stuff to make it handicap accessible because I, I can't sit down and get up without holding on to something. I'm constantly breaking toilet seats, regular toilet seats. So they, they're going to put the bigger um, heavy-duty toilet seats, well, ha you know, the handicap accessible type toilets in my, in my house. So what I'm not hearing is grab bars and uh, basically railings throughout the rest of the house. I'm hearing. Well, yeah, you know, the well, that's what I'm in on the on the stairway. They're going to put the grab bars and they're going to put the grab bars in the bathroom also. Okay. And I, I have a pool which I do utilize for. Um, I utilize the pool for you know for uh, rehab to kind of do some stuff. And I have no railing, so they're going to put railings in my pool too so i can hold on to to help me get in and out and while i'm in the pool to hold on grab bars because i don't have any grab bars there so they're going to put grab bars you know throughout my house to help me okay yeah. what uh what have you studied to learn as to what's available for movement assistance and sitting standing up assistance beyond those i am um, nothing really i i I just had a, a, a case manager came out and they did an assessment and they looked at my house and what was in it and they 
saw what my disability issues were, and they based their assessment on these other things that I need in my house. And I, I told them some things that I needed, and so they approved that. They did approve, and I'm just waiting for the contractors to come and do their assessment next month so they could then start the work. If you knew about more accommodations that were available, would you have requested more if they would help you? Yes, if, if they would, I would. Okay. But, you know, all this is new to me, so I don't, I don't really know. Are there special, <laughs> you know, uh, items made for kitchens for disabled people? I, I would imagine there is. I have researched it. You know, like I said, I guess there is. Are there special type of floor coverings that assist disabled that have difficulty uh, with mobility, with fall risk, things like that? I'm pretty sure they do because I they do have it documented that I have fallen, you know, oh. over my course of my disability. I've fallen quite a few times. So I am going to um, put it on you to go ahead and do some more research about disability products that would accommodate you at home that they could potentially install in your house to improve your life. Um, because, you know, remember, you're one slip away from a bad day. You are one additional uh, putting your body through some strenuous situation, some movement where it could cause another neurological stroke based issue. Um you really want to seek out, maybe I should do a video on that, on all the things, you know, how to max out your home, like how to have the crib of cribs for a disabled person. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that'd be a great idea. That's a really good idea, madame. Thank you so much for that idea. We're going to do that, you know? Okay. Perfect. And, and also, um, my, I'm, because I am seeing a, a therapist and a psychiatrist regularly mm -hmm. on a regular basis, um, my counseling has exacerbated my PTSD. Mm -hmm. That is what I'm doing now. That's why I can't really do too many clients, but I want to try to see if I can do it. But it's, it's exasperating because apparently now a lot of my clients, even though I'm working for a private organization, mm -hmm. are, are veterans. <laughs> sure, sure. And, and of course, I'm treating them for the things, some of the things that they've experienced, I've experienced in combat because I'm a combat veteran. Sure. And so it's exacerbating my my PTSD. And, and so the psychiatrist knows of it. And, you know, I'm having counseling sessions weekly and they're aware of it. So, you know, um, just a lot of things going on with my disability that's dragging me down right now. That's why I have these questions. And I was just curious when he sent me that letter. I'm like, okay, I'm trying, but it doesn't mean I'll be able to go back to work full time. Right. I right. need something. To, uh, you know, I don't want to gain the system or anything like that. Well, remember, shaping your work path based on your impairments to also fit within the financial requirements of the SSA is not gaming the system. It's surviving, you know. Um, and and, right, I, and right. I propose the following to you. Um, go ahead and learn about extended eligibility rules. Also go learn about accommodations and how employers can go ahead and put them, register them, all those things within their system. Um, make sure the HR group basically works with you to develop a plan, all crucial for your type of impairment and the retention of benefits. Okay. So, so documentation is key. Yeah. Especially with my job, that they're documenting that I am disabled and that I do need assistance to help me in my job. Remember, benevolent employer. They are a benevolent employer. Keywords used in the SSA system for jobs that do not exist in the national economy. Okay. Well, could you repeat that? I quite understand. Sure, sure. Said, I'll, 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 uh, so there's, there's basically a, a benevolent employer. That's somebody who gives you accommodations, has you do less than, than is usually required. And then there's your traditional employer, you know, through their, uh, you know, DOT dictionary of, of occupational titles, which, you know, it's the standard job as defined by the DOT uh, number. And so what you're looking to do is create and show and specify with documentation inside the corporation that can be, you know, essentially purchased using a HIP or a directive letter evidence that shows that you have a benevolent employer that's given you an easier job than normally would be allowed in the national economy. And therefore, 
makes your unique situation work preclusive as compared against the DOT or SEO? Okay, yeah, because I, I, I'm doing telehealth from home. I have to, mm -hmm. you know, I have to do it from home. And I have never, I, I'm going to have to ask them for certain things to see if they do it because I'm, I'm not a full-time employee mm -hmm. at all with them. I'm not full-time. So I, you, I thank you for giving me because a lot of this I didn't know. So I'm going to have to ask them, can they accommodate me with us with some certain things because of my disability? Sure. Absolutely. Even Absolutely. though I'm not full time. And, and remember, too, you might run into some issues where all of a sudden this corporation, the higher ups, weren't aware of what was going on. And uh, all of a sudden, these managers that your buddies with were helping you out. And now these executives are saying, well, why do we need her? Why can't we get somebody else? You're going to run into a bias problem if you don't already have the, the higher up execs aware of what's going on. So just be careful. And I will. And, and you may be right. But what I'm being told right now is that they have so many clients and not enough licensed clinical um, social workers to, to provide services for those clients. So they're short on um, eligible and licensed um, um, counselors. And so they're constantly trying to flood me with additional people, and I can't. I, I'm just unable to take them. I'm unable to take them. I mean, if I was um, not disabled, I, I could make a lot of money with the company, but I... Sure. I just can't do it. I'm able to, yeah. You know, it's funny that there's there's a lot of fish in the sea and sometimes not enough fishermen. Sometimes there's too many fishermen and, you know, basically not enough fish. Just make sure you're aware yeah. of the ratio because the ratio and your negotiation power are crucial. Okay. Okay. So so are you saying that even though um, I'm 100%, does Social Security even look at that, my PTSD, or not? Yeah, but they changed the rule. Remember, when Saul was in, Commissioner Saul, the Trump appointee, they changed the rule so that that could not be a definitive landmark and essentially in defining whether or not you were disabled. Rather, it's just something that they can use uh, as a piece of evidence of weight towards your benefit, but it is not a deciding factor. Okay. They can consider it, but it doesn't hold the weight that it used to. Okay, okay. So I'm, I'm pretty sure when they decided it was pretty much my stroke and me being in the hospital for over a month and go and and I still go through some therapy too. I still do some therapy. I've had the doctors, you know, send me to go through some therapy also. Perfect. Well, madam, I will catch you later. You have a wonderful, wonderful night, you know? Thank you so very much for contacting me. Absolutely. I'll catch you later. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Okay, guys, we're going to take this next call real quick. Hold on. And let's, there we go. Hi, this is Attorney Walter Not. We are live on YouTube. Remember to use a fake name throughout this process. Can I answer a specific question or would you like me to run hearing questions with you? Go ahead. Oh, yes. I have a specific question. Sure. Um, I am currently on SSI mm -hmm. and I kind of have a complicated um, problem here. Okay. I have a home that I had before I was on SSI. And we are unable to pay for it on the little disability that we get. And so I need to sell the house. Okay. And the main issue is we're going to have some equity. And I don't know if there's any way for us to roll that into the next place that we're going. Um, but the problem is, is that this home is owned by my mother-in-law. And we're not okay. actually going to be buying the house. So I don't know if there's any kind of contracts. I don't know. So are you are you paying money towards it at all? I mean, so so basically you're selling a house, you're moving into the mother-in-law's house, and yeah. that's a house that's paid yeah. off. So you, that's why you're doing it. Um, it's a, she actually just her her father died. My my husband's grandfather just died. So he or I'm sorry, I'm really nervous. Yeah, you're fine. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, she just. She just purchased that home from her siblings, from her sisters. Um, and we are going to be like taking care of it. We're going to be paying the property taxes, um, the homeowner's insurance, and like the upkeep of the house, any like maintenance things. Like we will be taking care of all those things. There's just not going to be like an actual mortgage. Um, 
I didn't know, you know, if there's any way to somehow give her the equity and like make it like for social security purposes, I guess say like, it's going to be used towards like the property taxes and, and things like that. Cause you know, we can't hold on to that money as you, you know, right. you know, you got a spend down problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. We got a spend down problem. <laughs> exactly. You know, honestly, what, what it sounds like you're trying to do is actually something that because what you're trying to do is use the money in a long-term sense, but what you'll be doing is violating the resource rule. And remember, you know, I'm assuming you're selling that other house for, for full value, right? It's not like a partial value, but like whatever money you can get, you're selling it for as much as you can get. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Yep. Oh yeah. Yep. We're going to go as much as we can. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. So what yeah. I would say is basically this, um, and your spouse is is he or she disabled or uh, on any program? He is, but he is not on disability. It's it's a complicated situation. His doctors are just not very good. That's a whole other <laughs> that's a whole other thing. Okay. Um, but yeah, he's not working. Yeah, he's not working. Okay. I mean, we do intend to live in this house for the rest of our lives. I don't know if that helps in any way. We're not going to be leaving. Like, we are going to eventually, like, this is going to be our house, you know, eventually. It's just for right now, our name will not be on the deed or anything like that. This is not going to end well. And, and here's here's why. Um, okay. You're going to have too much money in the bank, which is going to, you know, you're going to have income. That's going to violate it. And then you're going to have resources the next month, which is going to violate it. And if you just try and remove yourself from the equation and have your husband on it, then they'll ban you or suspend you for essentially, uh, you know, a period of time from even receiving mm -hmm. SSI benefits. So if you just hold on to that money, you will become yeah, ineligible. Yeah, I know. You can't do that. Right. So, I mean, I mean it's, yeah. And if you yeah. pay it out as rent, then it's still over the resource limit. So the problem. Yeah, is there any way to like give this as a lump sum to my mother-in-law through some kind of contract no, you'd have to something. buy it from I, her you'd have to you'd have to do a house transfer and buy it from her i mean is she willing to sell it to you because just giving her I money mean, and then yeah. having it magically paid off by her over time that's that they're going to figure that one out okay okay so what i would say okay now let me ask you this real quick um mm -hmm, sure. the house that you have right now yeah you know you're going through all this like changeover stuff and this and that and yada yada Mm -hmm. I mean, how many rooms are in it? Like, could you potentially rent out a room to help pay for the upkeep cost of it? No, it's just, it's just two bedroom and it's, it's tiny. Is I mean, there any land really on small. it where people could potentially park trailers or something like that, where you could, could collect some monthly uh, rental? Uh, I mean, there is a little bit of land, but I don't know. I mean, that's, Ooh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, you're thinking like don't sell. That's that's kind of where I'm hearing you go. Well, and here's why. Uh, you're in a much better situation right now than you're moving into. And you think that you're going into a good situation because you basically are just getting this other house that you just have to pay for stuff in, but you're already in that situation. You already have a house. It may is it paid off or no? No, the problem is I mean the, I mean to take it really into the whole situation. Um I, my my father is doing really unwell. He's really bad, and mm -hmm. he was helping us, mm -hmm. and that just is not going to continue. Um, I have an able account, and that's the only way that we've been surviving. So, without the able account, we would have been we would have been foreclosed on this home the moment I I got disability because our mortgages are is really high for how little the house is. It's just super high. So, I mean, we kind of don't have a choice. I mean, if there's no options, I mean, I guess I just, <laughs> I guess I just get kicked off. I don't know. Well, you don't want that. I mean, look, look. I mean, I don't, but gotta, I just, if you I don't want to go through a foreclosure either. <laughs> all right. So here's the deal. Yeah. Um, a lot of people. All right. I'm going to tell you a little story and, okay. uh, <laughs> you know, a little personal thing. Um, when I would date people, the, the women, you know, I date women just to kind of clarify that. Cause we live in that world now, but when I would date people, the women would want the classic HOA cookie cutter house. And I hated that. Cause I grew up on a farm, mm -hmm. like, you know, and I hated yeah. the HOAs and 
they would target me because I was an attorney or I was in law school or whatever. So I, when I bought my house, um, I bought it specifically where there was no HOA and any HOA that would come would be immediately put into jail. So, you know, basically the problem that I'm hearing is you can't afford the place where you're at, but you haven't considered buying another place that's in a cheaper area that's maybe farther out, you know, into a, a, a cheaper, you know, country road esque thing. So I guess my question to you is why aren't you just selling this house and getting something that's cheaper? Well, I mean, I mean, our house isn't that much. Um, it's just, it was a mortgage that my husband had before, you know, we were even married and stuff. And so we've just lived here, you know, our whole marriage now. And, um, what are the figures though? Like, m- give me the financials because if we're talking about, a I mean, the mortgage is, is, is a thousand a month, which is amazing, which is incredible. Wow. That's like astoundingly <laughs> good. Mean, now, have you tried and I reached mean, out to, area, it's not, though. have not you tried, have you reached out to those groups, the county groups, the state groups that help with mortgage payments and reducing them? Um, I have not. No, I have not. I've not. Okay. So have seen, you, you know what you can do there? Have you looked at renting any aspect of that place out at all, whether it's parking a trailer no. there, man, you are in an amazing, look, is it in, is the house in a safe neighborhood? Yes. Okay. Yep. Is the house, you know, is the roof reasonably good? Mm, I mean, it's not leaking right now, but no, not really, to be honest. <laughs> All right. But if you got somebody, to, is it a shingle roof or what is it? Yeah. All right. So shingle, you could yeah. go, you could, in theory, get a, a buddy help out, right? You're, 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 you know, who, you, where you're going to move her house, right? That person could, in theory, give you some money to go ahead and get the, uh, the white paint to have somebody go on the roof, paint the whole thing with that paint so that you get another 15 to 20 years out of that roof before it gets back to the shingles. Right. Okay. My my point is you got a really good thing here. Don't lose it. And downgrading to somebody else owning it. And then you losing your SSI benefits is a downgrade, you know? I guess I don't feel that way because the house that we are going to, um, it's actually my, it's the childhood home of my, my husband. Um, that's where he grew up and um it's also in a very nice area um so i just i mean this house we we, there's some other circumstances that are occurring in this neighborhood that is going to make this area really undesirable like so um they're going to be building a gas station right across from my house so which greatly increases uh, the price of your property Mm, not here, not, not where I'm at. Just, you know, I do, I already live in the country. Um, you know, here you, you don't really want to have all the lights and the noise and all that stuff. So maybe, and maybe in some areas that is an improvement, but not here. So I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're basically saying it's, this is just not going to really work. There's, there's really no legal way to like give my mother-in-law the equity. Without oh, SSI taking holes through it. If you're going to, you know, I mean, no. I mean, there's a, the, the, I mean, you know, I was trying to think of like a trust way or maybe it's like a loan, you know, thing or whatever. Yeah. Like maybe it's mm-hmm. a, a loan agreement. But yeah, the, the reality here is that, I mean, maybe you could just pay her for the next 25 years of rent, you know, like just, you know, here's the contract. I agree to pay this for the next 25 years of rent. But I, I can assure you, I can assure you, you are downgrading. I don't care how nice that new house is, you are downgrading. You are downgrading from home ownership to somebody else is going to tell you how to live. Somebody else is going to tell you what to do. And that when push comes to shove, when either he passes away or you pass away, you are in a shittier situation every way you look yeah. at it. Yeah, I mean, but you've I already know. decided. I guess I disagree. So I know, I know. Look, and I got into arguments with my ex-girlfriends about this and I, oh, they would push me about how they wanted this home in this neighborhood. They wanted to live in Winter Park. Yeah. (laughs) If the house I lived in now is nice, there are some other circumstances. I don't know I want to give too much away because I I have my money to do. I don't know. The, the, The mortgage that we have on this house is not in either of our names. That is the problem. And we need to, we need to get out of this place. Like we, we really don't have a choice. Um, cause if we foreclose, we, it is going to be bad. So it's in an ex's name. 
so it will not be good. <laughs> it's so in an we X's just, we just name? Need, like an X? Yeah. yeah it's, All right. So now we're about, talking about real issues. Yeah. Now we're talking about conversion oh, yeah. problems. So this this isn't even in your name in any way. Or or who's who's the ex of? Uh, my husband. So yeah. it's in his name and her name. It's only in her name. Oh. Only in her name. At Let, some point, the mortgage company sold the loan and, and dropped his name off it. Well, we don't know when that happened. That, that was changes years ago. everything. <laughs> okay, I don't I mean... <laughs> That's, that is one of those like okay. important things that people leave out during the show. And then they call me later and like, Sorry, hey, by the way... <laughs> I just don't want, well, I just, I'm like, I'm kind of afraid to give too much away. I feel like this is a really unique situation. So well, no, I, yeah, I'm nobody kind of knows who you are. Yeah, nobody knows who you are. Nobody knows what your phone number is or any of that stuff. So they can't link back okay. to you. But the, the bottom line is this, you know, if, if we really examine this situation, you don't mm -hmm. actually have ownership. And what, I mean, what happened to this ex? This ex? Um, I mean, there we, we do own, like he has the deed. That was in the divorce agreement and everything. It's just that the mortgage is not in his name <laughs> it's really messed up so, so he I mean, has we, we legal... own the house i mean it is oh, ours man. it's just the mortgage is not <laughs> yep so, so you're paying payments i mean is she still alive yes as oh, far man. as we know is, yeah yeah as far is, as we know yeah this is a fantastic situation this is like a, I, i'm, I'm like telling a... you i've been dealing with this for a long time so you know, it's my, my doggy's got to go outside. So actually, I'm going to have to end the show a little bit early tonight. But um, I have to think about how best okay. for you to handle this because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's yeah, some there's issues. First I and know. foremost. That's why I'm saying like, I, I'm like, it's so there's so many angles. I tried to call an attorney about it and I couldn't even explain it to them. I was like, I don't know. I was so nervous to call. So. All right, you got to call me next week because I have to literally think about this during the next week. Okay. This, okay. Uh, because the first thing is, okay. do you de facto have true potential ownership, even though you're not on the deed? Like, did the judge yeah. order that? You know, and then what proof do you have of that document that he ordered that? And then why wasn't he added back to it? You know. Well, I mean, we have we have the deed of this house. We have it. We, it's definitely that. There's no issue selling the house or any of that. It's just the mortgage is being. It's not. I don't. We don't know what happened there. Um, but we, we, but my husband is financially responsible. All of that is in that stuff. But this is one of the reasons why we have to get out of here. We just want to kind of just close this door and, and just move forward. So I just so have, that's why. Yeah. Yeah. So I so. just want to ask one thing though. If, if, if the mortgage, how much is still owed mm -hmm. on this thing? A lot, like six. I mean, for us, it's a lot, 60,000 or something. God, I wish I was in your man. I, my student loans, my, by the way, everybody on YouTube, my student loans just for the first time are now under three hundred thousand dollars so if you want to have a party wow. <laughs> that's that's good you know wow. um yeah 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 everything <laughs> is <laughs> i i would be having panics about that oh i do wow. i do i do i wake up sometimes yeah, okay. i find myself talking to myself i do <laughs> um so what i would say is this the only thing i'm worried about is when you go to sell this thing and there's a mortgage that has to be paid off i'm assuming yeah. that this property is worth more than sixty thousand dollars right it is yes thanks yes thankfully yeah yep. okay and i'm yes. assuming that um after you know taxes have you guys figured out what you're going to end up with if it sells for what you think it might um because that's I mean, important exactly <laughs> i mean yeah. i don't know it's hard to say in this area i i, I mean we I would love if we got 140 for our house, but that seems high to me. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know. All right. So, you know, our house isn't like the greatest thing, you know, I'm just, just being yeah, honest. Yeah. My house <laughs> yeah. isn't the great. I bought my dream home. My dream <laughs> home was like, you know, Lego blocks yeah. that they put together, you know, every time that she got <laughs> mad at him and he said, okay, I'll give you what you want. That's my house. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah yep. I kind of understand. Yep. Yeah. Yep. You know, but, um, <laughs> I guess um, and I'm so glad for it too. The windows by the kitchen, fabulous, fabulous. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I would say this. Um, I have to really think about what your best approach would be because yeah. paying rent that she can use to pay for stuff uh, on, on a on a yearly basis because you're allowed to pay rent in, di in different mm -hmm. forms. You don't have to pay rent okay. rental or weekly or monthly. You could pay it yearly or multi-year or whatever. Okay. But I just, yeah. ah, buddy, I would, 
uh, there's so many potential. Uh, I see here, uh, Miss Smith over here said there's grants, there, there's programs. God, there's so many things. And look, look, I get it. I get where you're coming from, but mm -hmm. uh, to, to not, how close are you to paying the mortgage each month? Like how much extra do you need each month? Well, I mean, I am, I'm only on SSI, so I mean, I'm getting yeah, you eight forty one, yeah, yeah, eight forty one, and then you know all other expenses. I mean, we don't have that many expenses, honestly. It's what's kind of sad about it all, but it's just this the mortgage and the house is just it's it's just been like an anchor in our life for like pretty much our whole marriage, the whole eighteen years. <laughs> so we kind of just want to get out of here, I guess. Is sort of it, so. Can I make an, I mean, I, I, yeah, I just, I want to make a, so here's, here's what I would do. First off, if I were you, I would talk to a realtor, find out what it would actually sell for. Number two, I would talk to a financial analyst and see what okay. your options are with the house as to how you can make money off it. Number three, bring all of that back to me because you're going to have a totally different outlook and a totally different plan the next time we talk. And please, for the love of God, figure out what the mortgage problem fix is with this situation. Because when you go to sell it, that's like selling something that you owe money on that isn't even attached to the proper name. And that's scary. Well, I mean, I understand. I, I mean, we've been paying it for 18 years with, you know, my checks, my name. So, I mean, it's. I so, think we would just write a check out to them. You know, I don't think that would actually be a problem. We just write it out. I don't think they care who pays the mortgage. <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. think the mortgage company cares. They, they got their money. They're, they're fine. But, you know, you so, do realize you've been paying down on a house of mortgage, mm -hmm. you know, of ownership of his ex-wife and that you're yeah, basically, I mean, I understand. you're freeing her and she's going to, make a claim to, I mean, what, what access does she, did she fully give up rights to this house? Oh yeah. Yeah. Everything's gone. Yeah. But like legally, yeah. did she like, it's in the contract signed by the judge. I mean, I assume so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know entirely, but yeah, there's no, yeah, there's nothing that she can do. Yeah. That's, we did actually talk to an attorney about that in the deed and all. Yeah. That, that we know is fine. We know there's no problems there. Okay, good. Because that, yeah. that scares yeah. me. Because, you know, remember, yeah, no. Everything's the closing, okay there. you know, the closing, that whole thing is part of it, which can screw up whether or not the next person can take a proper title, you know, like the proper yeah. deed. Because you may yeah. have to, you may have to provide a lesser deed as a result of that, thereby lowering your price. Yeah. Um, just I, something, you know. I've, yeah, yeah, I have no idea. I'm trying. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out. But this is a good step. <laughs> figure you, this all out. Yeah, this this is a good first step because we're spitting ball and ideas of yeah. like what to watch out for, you know. And that's that's the best first step you can take. First step is what are the problems? Is there a lien against the property? Does the property have issues that can be fixed prior to sale? Is this an as is gig? You know, yada yada. I mean, yeah, this mm -hmm. is this is a good first step. Um, you have a little road in front of you that has some mountains on it, but still. Um, uh, I just hate when disabled people lose a house. Although you definitely, it's with her sixty grand on a, a mortgage that's not even in his name and attachment. That changes yeah. things. But I will yeah. catch you uh, next week because okay. my doggy is yep, about okay. to. Thank you yeah. so much for yeah. Yeah. for helping me out. Absolutely, you have a wonderful, wonderful night. Yep, you too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. So guys, I have to end the video a little bit early. I know it's 946. We didn't make it all the way to 10, but my doggy is literally running around. I think she threw up a little bit. Um, you know, so with that said, sweetie, who is literally right here. What's wrong, chubby dog? What's wrong, sweetie piggy? I've got a chubby piggy right here. Anyways, I got to let the piggy out and uh, I'll catch you guys a little bit later. She's going to knock the thing over. Have fun. Thank you for showing up tonight, guys. I will do some videos in the not too distant future. And there is a huge huge surprise coming up that I'm really excited to share with you guys. I'll catch you later. Have a wonderful night. And we'll go from there. Thanks so much, guys. Bye-bye, guys. Bye-bye.